and the dragon flew in. He danced with the earth good genie. And for that year, there was joy and prosperity in Vietnam. For the dragon is the symbol of everything joyous and good. So goes our ancient myth, and a beautiful myth it was. Until one day, the ruthless hand of man struck down the dragon. And peace and happiness fled our land. This is our Vietnam, a country in the grip of a vicious war. From up here, our country looks unscarred, beautiful, serene. She doesn't show the ravages of bitter battles, nor the ruthless enemy who would bind the hands and gag the mouth of her people. Yes, this is our Vietnam today. For years that to us are like centuries, we have not known the face of peace. For the hand that struck the dragon had struck us also. That blasphemous, blood-stained hand belonged to our countrymen and kin from the north, obsessed by an ambition to take over our country, possessed with a merciless intent to impose their ideology on us. They have sown terror and subversion and violated the sovereignty of the Republic of Vietnam. But we are fighting back and other friendly nations imbued with the same love of freedom for which we are fighting are helping us to seek out and destroy the invaders wherever they may be found. Throughout the ages, freedom has always been more precious to us than life. In 43 AD, the Trung sisters left the Vietnamese against the Chinese invaders. Better die than lose our freedom, was their battle cry. And many Vietnamese died, including the heroic sisters. Chinese domination of our country lasted 800 years. Then Emperor Ngo Quyen ascended the throne. In one furious battle on the Bạch Đằng River, Ngo Quyen destroyed the mighty Chinese fleet. Vietnam was free again. In 1284, our ancestors again faced subjugation by our ancient foe to the north. Powerful and ruthless Mongol hordes had invaded Vietnam. The reigning sovereign, Tran Nhan Tung, summoned the country's elders. In an extraordinary referendum, the emperor posed two questions to the elders. Should they bow their necks to the invaders' yoke or fight for freedom and country? The reply was immediate and unanimous, fight for freedom. And our forebears fought and defeated the vastly superior Mongol forts. Since then, the centuries have tumbled down the waterfalls of time and flowed on. The years brought some change. Our northern kin had exchanged their ideals of freedom for a foreign ideology incompatible with the Vietnamese love of freedom. Worse still, they would deprive us of our liberty and right to live along the pattern of freedom for which our ancestors died. They have become a tool of the ancient foe who now seek domination, not only of Vietnam, but all Asia as well.
They wreak widespread destruction to realize the inordinate ambition of their leaders. They destroy much that was beautiful and precious to our way of life. They try to ruin our country's progress, a progress achieved at the cost of long years of planning, of toil and sacrifice. They pillage, they maim, they terrorize, they kill and kill not caring whether their victims are combatants or not, as long as the killing serves their purpose. Oh, they have bathed our once beautiful land in blood and tears. But the blood and tears that wring most our hearts are those of our innocent children. For what have they done that they too must be maimed for life or die in the innocence of their childhood? Yet they too must suffer victims of the enemy's obsession to turn us into slaves of their ideology. But let not our people weaken in the battle against aggression and terrorism. The spirits of our heroes stand guard over us. From out of the past, they reach out to us with the memories of their unceasing struggles to overthrow oppressors and invaders who would rob them of their liberty. Their struggles had been bitter and long, and many times they had failed. Yet they had fought on until, in the end, they had triumphed. As a result of the 1968 Tet Offensive, most of those venerable monuments to the glory of our past are now destroyed. Hue, our ancient capital, rich in the cultural tradition and memories that were our sacred heritage, is today a mass of rubble. It's one of the tragic prices we must pay in our courageous fight for freedom. Also destroyed were much of what we have built. Destroyed, too, many beyond hope, were the lives and homes of several hundred thousand of our people. Buddhism has been our religion for centuries. It is the religion even now of the major part of our population. Our Buddhist hierarchies have recently taken an active interest in the political life of our nation. Because of its wide spiritual influence on our people, Buddhism is a powerful constructive force in our desperate struggles to build a free, united and progressive nation. The Catholic faith and other religions exist side by side with Buddhism in our country. This is only right and proper. For religious freedom and tolerance are two basic marks of a truly enlightened people. Freedom means also the right to interpret our religious beliefs in the light that we see them. This is true of the Hua Ha sect, which bases its beliefs on Buddhism and local religious concepts. The same is also true of the Kao Dai or any other religious sects. For ours is a democratic society and every man is free to worship his God in the way he pleases. But whatever religion we may belong to, let us not forget that we are first and foremost Vietnamese. As Vietnamese, we owe our country our unselfish, united support to keep it free and independent. Otherwise, we may lose the religious freedom we now enjoy. The dangerous, difficult conditions in the rural areas have disheartened some of our farmers. But a great many more do not give up set their jaws firmly and continue to work, usually to the accompaniment 
not of planting or harvesting songs, but of the fearsome cacophony of savage battles being fought nearby. These are basically the people who have made it possible for our country to survive ancient Chinese domination. Our farmers have sometimes been referred to as soldiers of the soil. The phrase has assumed for us a meaning that is more than figurative. In these critical times when the vicious foe tries to throttle our economy, the farmer is the soldier who helps nullify the enemy's attempt. Therefore, a farmer who plans his land to fill our people's needs is as worthy as the soldier fighting the enemy in the battlefield. The government is meeting the challenge of the enemy's economic sabotage. Among other ways, the government helps our farmers to increase their crop yields through improved seeds and modern methods of agriculture and irrigation. Fighting off the enemy with one hand, the government builds with the other. To help the people achieve a better standard of living, the government trains and assigns revolutionary development groups to hamlets liberated from the enemy. The cadres advise and work with the people in self-help projects that will improve their economic and social condition. They awaken the villagers' sense of civic responsibility by guiding them in constructive community activities. All self-help and community projects are done on a partnership basis with the government. The government furnishes the materials and technical advice. The people provide the labor. cadres organize the people into a hamlet defense force. And when the enemy attacks, they help defend the hamlet together with friendly troops stationed nearby. In spite of the raging war, our government has not stopped looking after the welfare and health of our people, for this is one of the many decent attributes of our way of life, that we look on our people not as chattel, but as human beings. Our fishing activities, too, have been affected by enemy harassment. But our fishermen are determined to let neither the war nor the enemy disrupt their means of livelihood. Like the rest of our people, they have learned to live and work calmly amid the violence of war. The government has also been active. It is improving and expanding our fishing resources to enrich our diet, create more jobs, and increase our exports of seafood to countries abroad. In-country commerce is reduced but does not stop. Overland or by rivers and canals, our villages bring their produce to the markets undaunted by enemy harassment. Yes, our domestic commerce moves on. Maybe not with the rush of the roaring rapids, but it moves on gently, persistently, like the irresistible, quiet flow of our rivers, twisting bravely here and there to avoid obstacles, but always flowing on. The enemy would be happy to see the economic collapse of the Republic of Vietnam. He knows it would render his takeover of our people less difficult to accomplish. But here again, as on the battlefield, the enemy finds himself frustrated. We have not become weaker. On the contrary, we have been building our economic sinews. We are stronger industrially than we were a few years ago.
more factories are going to rise in Vietnam as the government continues to create a favorable climate for new industries. This modern factory supplies much of our paper needs. We could expect that this would not be the last paper factory that would be built in Vietnam. More paper factories would do away completely with our present importation of newsprint and other kinds of paper. We have been weavers for centuries. It is still one of our most important and widespread occupations. But the primitive looms of the yesteryears have given way to fast, ultra-modern, efficient machinery and up-to-date manufacturing techniques. This is in keeping with our march forward. For in a society of free enterprise like ours, the industry that stands still or refuses to advance with the needs of the times might as well be dead. Time and again, war's destructive fist crushes to rubble an accomplishment achieved. But this neither discourages nor halts us. Instead, we look at it as a challenge and forge forward. In some untried aspects of our industrial development, the government establishes pilot plans to show the way for new industries. pioneers in the manufacture of cement, for instance. Business participation is a policy followed by a democratic government in any developing country to open new fields of industrial growth. Government participation, however, is limited to industries which do not compete with private enterprise. We are an emotional and sentimental people. Tears come easily to our eyes when our feelings are touched. But adversity leaves us practical and our eyes tearless. Pressed closely by the hardships of existence, we dig down into the resources of our minds to discover means for survival. Handicraft has been one of our many lifelines. Our history bears us out. We have not existed as a people for over 2,000 years without learning how to survive in the midst of turbulence and adversity. With the Chinese on top of us for half that time, the wonder was that we ever emerged as a people at all. latent will and strength of the Vietnamese people to resist national oblivion is demonstrated in our arts. It's also very evident in our drama. Nearly a thousand years of Chinese domination have failed to submerge the Vietnamese personality. Out of what the Chinese civilization could give, we fashion our own. In the end, we evolved a culture and art distinctively stamped with our own individuality. Tenacity prerequisite to survival has even reached into the educational field. The years of war have not blocked our determination to build and modernize our educational system. Today we have government and private universities where before they were practically non-existent. Doctors, so much needed in Vietnam, graduate every year from our medical school.
nor has the government neglected vocational training for the youth of the land. young men are beginning to discover the great importance to their future of a technical training. Attendance in trade schools have quadrupled during the past few years. Instructors from the free world help us build a force of technicians. Even more gratifying is the progress in elementary education. We have now just under two million school children attending elementary school. That is three times the figure in 1954. Enrollment will inevitably increase as new schools are built and more teachers are trained. We have recently achieved a giant step in the creation of a representative form of government. September 3, 1967, we held a free and democratic election for president, vice president, and 60 senators. We elected the members of the lower house the following month. always claimed that he represented the Vietnamese people. So he attempted to intimidate and terrorize our people to prevent a large turnout of voters. But determined that nothing short of death would stop us from electing a government of our free choice, we stubbornly flocked to the polls, virtually taking our lives in our own hands. The enemy's terroristic tactics claimed about 900 victims all over the country. But we dealt him a terrible slap in the face by turning out our mass for the election. Of that defiance and determination, we should always be proud. No people can be defeated or enslaved who possess that kind of courage. Life goes on. In the highlands, life seems tranquil and aloof. But our mountain people are not deceived. They too love freedom and the enemy dislikes them for being uncooperative. Also in central Vietnam, along the coast between Phan Thiet and Nha Trang, the Chams live in the centuries-old customs and traditions of their forebears. A thousand years ago, the Chams were a powerful and warlike nation. They left monuments to their greatness and power. Like the rest of our people, the modern Chams are contributing to the national effort to keep Vietnam free. This is our Vietnam today country and a people struggling to live a normal life amidst a vicious war. We do not want this war. We want to live in peace. The northern invaders say they want to liberate us. Liberate us from what? We have freely chosen our way of life. Through the ballot we have chosen our leaders. We don't need to be. We don't want to be liberated because we are free. We are freer than they in the North could ever dream or hope for. Free from autocratic dictation. Free to do whatever we desire within the rule of the law. Free to go wherever and whenever we wish to go. Free to browse among the books. Free to think, to plan, to work out our individual destinies. 
free even to relax if we can afford it. All this is a part of our way of life. Even the way we mourn and bear our dead to their final resting place is a part of it. We don't want to be saved from it. With the arrival of Tet, hope springs anew in the hearts of our people. Expectantly, we ask ourselves, could this be the year? For we mark our new year by the rebirth of spring, and spring signals the renewal of nature. The flowering plants burst into happy, very colored blossoms. The creatures of the earth, including man, move with newborn vigor. The spring, we hope, would give birth to light and reason in the darkened minds of our northern kin. We want to enjoy a prosperous tomorrow. We would like to savor the sweetness of a life of peace in full. Not the peaceful existence of slaves, but the peace that comes from knowing that we live in freedom. We love our children and would like them to grow up in an atmosphere of national harmony and tranquility. It is true, we pray for peace, and we hope it will come soon. But we won't give up our freedom, never, for the peace of slaves. <laughs>